Hey guys, what's up? So this is going to be kind of complementary to what Sonny just went through essentially. Um, so Sonny was kind of talking about app chains in particular. This also kind of applies to that as well. Um, but I'm going to take a different view and go for specifically app specific rollups. Um, but you can do the same thing with an app chain, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, I'm Mass. I go by Raining Coffee on Twitter. Uh, I do research at Mave 11, uh, which is a VC fund out of uh, Amsterdam. And essentially what we're going to go through today is modular infra versus modular in a software, and why I think apps should become infra instead of just staying as apps applications on a smart contract uh, platform. Um, and then we'll get into sort of the app specific rollups and why I think for most use cases, they fit better than a specific app chain. And then the reasons why are specifically related to ordering, also monetization, customization, complementation, and also curation and specialization. So the methodology for today is going to be this, essentially. When I say monolithic app chain, I mean chains like Osmosis. So they do everything, execution, settlement, data availability, consensus. When I say modular app chain, I specifically mean something that has been split up. So a roll up that does execution, that is using some settlement layer or a data availability layer. And there's also some talk often about modular software versus modular protocols. I'll say Custom SDK is a modular software. So you can mix and match modules however you see fit. Um, and a modular protocol would be something like a Celestia that only does data availability and consensus, and like a roll that does execution. Um, and what we're seeing now as well is sort of a merger. So we're seeing a lot of rollups being built specifically with Custom SDK, with Summon SDK as well. Um, so there's a merge of the two happening um, at the very moment. We're going quick. All right, so why do you think you guys should become uh, infra as an application? Well, it's sort of into two different parts. There's economic reasons, and then there's customization reasons. So one of the big reasons for wanting to control your own block space, be your own sequencer, be your own uh, blockchain, is specifically for ordering. So if you control ordering, you control in which direction and which list that transactions come into. Um, and you also the one who proposes whatever gets put into the next block, uh, which means if you're using some priority gas auction, you can extract that MEV, which is pretty, uh, pretty important for like most applications. So most applications, like a Uniswap, for example, is causing a lot of MEV, but none of it is ending up in a token holders of Uniswap or the LP's hands. It's all going to validators of Ethereum. Um, so that's a pretty big problem here. And then you also have resource pricing efficiency. So if you control your own block space, you can control how much things cost, and you don't, you're not dependent on gas cost loads on Ethereum, for example. So you might have an NFT mint going on that's causing crazy gas prices to go up. Well, you don't have that, but you control your own, own block space. And then customization reasons. So what we're seeing happen a lot now, both on, in the customer ecosystem, but also on eigenlayer with AVSs, is, is that we're seeing a lot of applications start to customize. So this could be new opcodes, it could be new pre-compiles. For example, like a CK verify chain that has new curves that allows us to verify CKPs more efficiently. And then we're also seeing the rise of alt VMs. So we're seeing Move come out to Ethereum rollups. We're seeing SVMs come out with Eclipse, uh, Ethereum rollups. And you can even go wilder than that. You don't have to like pick an existing VM, but you can also go and say, I want a VM specifically for a clop, or I want a VM specifically for verifying CKPs. Um, and then you can scale as you need. So if you don't need crazy hardware to begin with, but you might need that down the road. Well, you can start pretty slow um, with like cons- consumer level hardware. And then when you need crazy scaling, you can start to do stuff like Solana. And so specifically to monolithic app chains. So you do get a lot more control. You can internalize a lot more. And you don't have any dependencies, which is pretty important in some cases where you are a very, very large application. I think DYDX is a great example. Osmosis is a great example. I think something like a Maker or Uniswap probably also great examples to this. Um, one big issue with specifically application-specific chains is the orchestration required to run with 100 validators, all from different infrastructure providers, and sort of the security budget that you're paying out to them. So if you have 100 different validators, well, they have some cost associated with that. You have to pay inflation to cover that. Um, and if you're an AMA or DEX like Osmosis, you also have to incentivize your LPs, which is also pretty problematic as well. Um, so I think what we're seeing happen now is we're seeing smart contracts funnel into app-specific rollups, and then if you come big enough, you can go ahead and become an app chain. 
Um, but that's a pretty big choice. I think TYDX is the perfect example of this. Um, so this is kind of the point of this talk to some extent, is that apps want control. They want the power of an app chain. But most of them can simply not pay the security budget of one. So what do you do? Well, you can inherit some security. So the first part that I think a lot of people look at is DA. So this is the last bastion of truth. Whatever you have on the DA layer, you can use to get the state of, of the box. Um, so that's kind of the last bastion of truth. You can also use settlement. So a lot of people will use Ethereum as a settlement layer for dispute resolution of fraud proofs or CKPs. Um, and you also get some liquidity in most cases from this as well. And then you can go with consensus. So this is sort of the shared security model of interchain security with the Cosmos Hub or Eigenlayer as well. However, I think the third is not the charm. So there's quite a lot of added cost to the providers of this economic security. So in the case of the Cosmos Hub, I have to run new runtime, state machines. So that's more hardware. It's more DevOps. And the same goes for Eigenlayer as well. So in most cases, the amount of security that an app might want is going to be so high that the inflation or the fees they're paying out is not enough to cover this. Um, I think we've seen that specifically with Neutron, for example, which gives away, I think, 25% of transaction fees to the customers of validators. But in most cases, that's not enough to cover the extra cost that you're adding. And there could be a situation where you've opted in to something. Um, this could be like an AVS. So you're, you're getting some economic security as an operator. Um, and then you're losing money on this. And you can't opt out because you've opted into some contract. Um, and especially, you're getting extra slashing. So with DA, the DA validators are not opinionated. They don't care about the data you're posting. They'll make sure it's in a block. However, um, they're not getting extra slashing conditions. But if you are a custom type validator, or if you are an eigenlayer operator, you're adding extra slashing conditions. In most cases, at least in eigenlayer, this is social slashing. Um, so maybe Shiram will say, I'm not going to slash, and we're totally fine. But well, Preferably, that's not what's going to happen. Um, and to be honest, I think there's some idea of that. Do you want alignment, or do you actually want shared security? So I think in most cases, a lot of people will go with Eigenlayer for the alignment with Ethereum and with a very powerful project. But the cost associated with this is, is quite high. So unless the token appreciation continues over time, I think right now we're all pretty bullish. So maybe that's totally fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, but there is some cost associated with running an app chain. So if you have 100 validators, well, they're all spending a pretty decent amount of money, up to 50K, 15K. Um, and if you're supporting a lot of chains that are not providing a lot of fees or a lot of inflation, then you might end up losing quite a lot of money. So what I think people should be doing is modular app chains. So this is just app-specific roll-ups. Um, and you should just inherit one thing. That is DA. And it's the last passion of truth. So you derive some security while still gaining some sovereignty. And you still get specialization and customization. And you also get way lower security budgets. Um, and it says your only cost is the DA fees. And with DA being commoditized with Celestia, Avail, Eigendata to some extent, this is quite low. You have some execution cost of running the compute. You have some state storage. Um, and you have a pretty big overhead profits to take from this. The L2s and Ethereum are a good example of this. They're making a pretty decent amount of money. And you still get to retain ordering powers, which I think is the most important part for a lot of specifically DEX or AMMs that are building applications that they lose as a smart contract. Because this is where you can do cool things like fair ordering. You can do frequent batch auctions. Um, and you can also take uh, priority fees as MEV, which is quite power powerful. And one thing you also get to do is that we talked about the cost earlier. You get to start to commoditize your complements. So, Pick a DA layer that's relatively cheap. That's not going to cost you much. Maybe you'll outsource something for execution as well. There's plenty of these products coming out as well. Um, you can also start to do things like active state on disk, keep it in memory. And you can start to do pretty crazy block sizes as well. And what we're seeing is sort of this commodity price starting to happen. So there's a ton of competitors offering pretty indistinguishable projects um, or goods. Um, and obviously, this doesn't matter that much now. Um, because most people do care about narrative and BD. Um, but as this matures, I think lowering your cost as much as possible, so for the cheapest execution or the cheapest cost to your end user, is, is pretty damn powerful. Um, and as we talked about late earlier, the MEV part is quite powerful for a lot of applications. I think what we're starting to see is sort of this API economy that we see in Web2. So you might just plug into a DA layer. 
you might plug into a settlement layer. So this is sort of starting to happen. A lot of the apps built in Web2 are primarily done with, with APIs. And I guess really the, the biggest point of this presentation is that ordering is super, super important. So when the transaction supply chain that the proposed order sequence lies in an app-specific chain or an app-specific rollup is very, very powerful. So you can specifically change the direction which transactions come into, what part they come into, and you can take some priority fee. This is usually based on some auction. So this could be like a priority gas auction. It could also be latency. So Arbitrum Optimism is all latency based. So they even work at like MEV, like in, in, uh, in TradFi, where it's primarily just latency. Um, so if you have the power to control ordering, you control the power to extract to be paid MEV, which is quite powerful. So you get much easier monetization, and you can also allow to do kind of cool customizational things, specifically verifiable sequencing rules. So I can do buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, and only sell, 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 buy, 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 if the price is better now than at the beginning of the block, um, or if there's no other transaction in the other direction. You can also do things like frequent batch auctions. We're seeing this happen not specifically on rollups, but off-chain with things like CowFi. Um, you can also do swap splitting. So if I have a specifically large order, the sequencer could put this into different blocks and then post it on-chain. Um, you can also do things like intent-centric applications, which we'll get into a little bit as well. So one of the cool things about this is sort of the fair ordering you can do and the things you can start to change within blocks. So what we're seeing with escape guys with block SDK is that you can start to make highway lanes within a block. So you can do things like a priority lane that is only for whitelisted searchers, arbitrators, or liquidators. And in this highway, they're essentially extracting fees from LPs. They're, not, they're, they're hurting them. However, you can do things like saying, if you're in this highway and you're ARPing, which is good for the pricing for the end users, but bad for the LPs, well, then you pay an extra fee and this is to offset the loss that you get from loss versus rebalancing as an LP. So I think this is some of the cool things that we're going to start to see, which should be quite cool. Um, and this is generally because some MV is pretty vital, specifically arbitrage and liquidation. So you do want to keep that in mind. Um, and you can also do this as like a constrained variable. So you can actually verify this. Uh, whether that's with uh, a fraud proof, you know, if you don't adhere to the, the set rules you've done, where well, you can get slashed with some bond. Or you can run this through a CK circuit and verify that it's been done correctly. So this priority fee is super, super powerful. And we're starting to see some rollups implement this. So Arbitrum is implementing Time Boost, which essentially is a top of block um, highway for searchers primarily, where they pay some extra priority fee to be included at the top. And then within that, it's based on latency. So you still get some web TradFi latency games but you do start to extract more fees. And even without these priority fees, Arbitrum is sequencer is making a pretty solid overhead because the costs are so low. And I think if you look at it from a sequencer perspective, so this could also be from the app's perspective, the only thing you're paying is maybe some issuance if you have some proof of stake, leadership election, or consensus on the rollout. Um, and you have some cost of DDA, state publication, storage, and execution that's covered earlier. Um, and then the fees you get overhead above that is then your, prior, is, is your, um, your monetization. So I think the best example of this is Uniswap. So a few days ago, Hayden said, you guys should be airdropping Uniswap holders. You should be airdropping Uniswap LPs because they're getting extracted from. So Uniswap LPs are not making a lot of money. It's a pretty hard job, especially on a Uniswap V3, to constantly be changing your LP position. So I think the example I want to give her is that in the case of Uniswap, them being an app chain or app-specific rollup could change the way they monetize. So currently on Uniswap, they're creating a ton of MEV. A lot of MEV flows and apps through Uniswap, but they get none of the fees from this. So in the case where Uniswap controlled ordering, well, they can control the priority fees. So the priority fees that searches are doing now through Uniswap, extracting MEV, is a massive issue for the LPs, and they're not getting any of it. So in the case of Uniswap, if they become app specific rollup or an app chain, kept like a liquidity contract on Ethereum to still have some composability with Ethereum itself, it would be pretty damn good for the token holders. So I think that the point is really that a lot of these apps want to monetize, but they can't do it when they can't control ordering. And this is especially true for AMMs and DEXs. So 
Uniswap is in a really bad position where they create a ton of MEV, but it all ends up in the hands of the Ethereum validators, which are not Uniswap LPs. They're not Uniswap token holders. So it's pretty bad. So if there was a world where Uniswap could control its ordering and essentially monetize these inefficiencies, it would be pretty massive for Uniswap and its token holders. And I think we're seeing sort of this happen to some extent with Uniswap X, Uniw4. Um, so I would probably say in a year or two, I could see Uniswap with an absolute roll up on top of Ethereum. I don't think they'll ever do an app chain. I think they want to be pretty close to the Ethereum community. Um, but I would expect that to happen at some point, because it's a lot of MEV they're leaving on the table. Now, beyond this as well, you can do a lot of customization. So specifically for a CK verification chain, and we're seeing some of these pop up like Aligned, Gevolut, and a bunch of others as well. On Ethereum now and other chains, there's not that big of a curve, curve support. So it's difficult to verify very secure CKPs. Um, and also, it doesn't support that many pre-compiles. So you can do very optimized rules as well for like a clop. If you want to do a fully on-chain clop as a roll-up, you can do that as well. Because you can control ordering, you can control the VM as well. And you can't do this with a smart contract. This is basically impossible because you're not controlling ordering, you're not controlling the VM, you don't control what AIPs get put through. But as an app specific rollup, you can. And you can also start to do very cool things in terms of specialization. So this could be hardware changes. Make some cranky Solana type setup with wild hardware, retain some security, and crank up the block size limit as well. Um, and you can even start to do things like preventing fraud. Um, so oftentimes, when you get a lot of exploits, we know they're happening, but we, we can't get the entire Ethereum validator set or the entire app specific uh, chain set to say, let's censor this one transaction because it's actually hurting our users. But if you control ordering as an app and you're seeing something completely wrong, some guy's pulling out 1 billion, but he only actually has the right for 100 million, when something is clearly wrong, and you can then set assertions that you should be censoring this specific transaction to not hurt the end user. And one thing that we're starting to see as well is sort of the, the rise of intents. Um, and I think we can start to do some very cool stuff with intents as an app specific rollup or even an app chain. So you can start to do things like all compassing front ends. So you can put like anything into these boxes, staking, trades, whatever it might be. And then you have some solver API. So we are seeing this with, with Rainbow as well. So Rainbow has a solver API to Enso Finance, which is a solver. They go do some action somewhere. Um, but the security is kind of lacking here. We're not really verifying what the solvers are actually doing. Some, most times, it's just the bond. In CowSwap's case, it's 50% of the trade in, Cow, in CowSwap tokens. Um, but if we can start to verify this and verify execution traces that it's actually happening correctly, we can actually start to do very secure intents. Um, but in most cases, this has to be in an environment where you can control most things, so not on a general smart contract platform. Um, so this is something I'm super excited for. Um, we're also seeing this happening with DSL. So Kalani, Essential, Brink are all doing things with DSL, so that could be quite cool. Um, so I think this is something that we'll start to see this year and the coming years, and it should be quite exciting. Now, what I've been saying today is also things you can do off-chain, but the problem if you do this off-chain on just some random nodes that you control is that you don't have any security. Um, so we're seeing a lot of these ordering controls happen for specifically order books, um, also intense with like freedom back auctions happening off chain, but you don't retain any security at all, but you can still do this off chain. Or you can start to do things like this with like a CKVM where you want this through like a VM extension and you verify this off chain as well. So this is also a possibility. And this ties into verifying the solver's intents as well. Now I think this is sort of the, uh, the end of this. I'll keep it relatively short and keep it on time. I think what we're seeing now is a crazy sort of proliferation of app chains, app specific rollups. This is sort of the world today, but I think this is only going to get crazier. We're going to get more DA layers, more settlement layers, more app chains, more app specific rollups. And I think what applications will start to realize is that they need customization, they need specialization, and they can only get this if they become an app chain or an app specific rollup. Um, and I think a lot of app developers are also a bit angry at the valuations that they're getting compared to infrastructure. So why not become both? Become app and infra. Um, and that's sort of the, the point of this. And I'm quite excited to see what we, uh, we get in the coming years. So uh, thanks for, uh, for having me. I hope you enjoyed it.